Hello, folks. Dr. Matt Moynihan here, giving another lecture on the oral history of fusion uh, research. Um, this lecture is going to be on modeling. Again, this whole series is grouped around the structure of my book, which I highly re recommend that you get a copy of. Uh, it's available on Amazon or, or other websites. So modeling, uh, or the, this is chapter one, which is the plasma science chapter, and it includes uh, some fundamental work about nuclear fusion and fission, and then some details on modeling. When it comes to modeling, um, there are uh, six or seven frameworks uh, which we are gonna discuss in this lecture. Now, what is, what is a framework? A framework is essentially a, a set of assumptions and in math equations around modeling a specific plasma. And what's the goal of a specific model, by the way, is to answer questions about the plasma and the functioning of the reactor itself. So when you get a new fusion approach and you need to evaluate it, you wanna ask questions like, how long will it take for the uh, plasma to ionize? Or how long will it take for the plasma to reach a bell curve? Or how long uh, will it take for the plasma to cool off and be completely useless? Or how much fusion reaction rates do we expect coming out of this bulk plasma at this time uh, right now? So a good model will tell you answers to specific questions and it will do a couple things other than just answer those questions. It will also give you insight into how the machine works and um, give you a test for how viable this fusion react reactor scheme is overall. Uh, is this reactor even a good idea from the start based on some basic uh, rough estimate, rule of thumb, back of the envelope type calculations? Or do we need to change the reactor concept? Moreover, is this reactor design a good design? Uh, do we need to make it smaller? Do we need to make it bigger? Do we need to make the magnetic fields uh, stronger or weaker? Do we need to make it run longer? Do we need different injection or different heating mechanisms? All of these questions can be answered by modeling the reactor up front. And by doing that, you're saving money and you're saving time because uh, running a computer model you know, you set one up properly, you get it working. If you know what you're doing, you can have answers in maybe three months, uh, two to three months uh, with the right uh, tools in place and the right knowledge set. And that is a lot faster than planning, building, sourcing, constructing, designing, and testing a full fusion reactor that might take you three to five years uh, and, and only to find out that the, the concept wasn't very good to begin with or that the machine needed to be stronger or bigger or smaller or something like that. So that's the value that comes with modeling. And modeling, uh, uh, there are folks in Fusion now that argue that Fusion has reached the point where the modeling has gotten so good. The tools, the mathematical framework, the plasma theory, all of three of these things together has gotten so good that you can now do a full-scale model of a reactor and get reasonable answers quickly and then change your reactor design. And you can model 20, 30, 40 different reactor concepts and reactor architectures well in advance of building anything. So the analogy everybody likes to make is with the Boeing 777 Dreamliner. The Boeing 777 Dreamliner was built circa 2009, 2010 timeframe. And it was the first aircraft that was com built completely virtually uh, over a million parts. Every part sized, specced, fitted, uh, assembled in one virtual aircraft uh, that was tested on a computer before it was ever built in real, t real life, before a prototype was ever built in real life. And so they could perfect the entire airline design uh, virtually. And you can do the same with a fusion reactor. That's essentially what folks are arguing. We can now model a full-scale fusion reactor. Uh, that's what folks are arguing. Now, can we model a full-scale fu fusion reactor? That's a very good question. No. <laughs> um, the limitations are, I, I tell folks that it's about 10 billion particles 
is about where um, modeling tools kind of max out. Now, 10 billion particles, and of course, this is changing year to year uh, and code to code and platform to platform, but roughly 10 billion particles is, is where you would assume that the top of the model would be, uh, the capacity of the model. And a 10 billion particle model is going to be done on a supercomputer like the National uh, Renewable Energy Computing Center at Berkeley uh, California, in Berkeley, California. So uh, a, a simulation like that would be something where a group of academics would get together, they would write a proposal, they would submit it to that uh, facility I just mentioned, that government facility. Uh, the government facility or committee would give its stamp of approval, the scientists would get paid for runtime or computing time on a, a platform like that. They would enter in their code that might be something written in uh, C++ or Python, for example, that would go out on a, a large scale computing system like Gr the Hopper, Grace Hopper. Um, there's a there's a computer called the Hopper, which is, you know, and I think it's a pen pentascale or exascale computing platform. Uh, that's going to do 10 billion particles over a certain number of time steps, and it's going to parallelize this. So it's got m like you know hundreds or maybe thousands of processors that are watching each specific chunk of the reactor and tracking individual particles as they pass through. So that's what 10 billion particle model simulations look like, and that's how much they cost, uh, and that's how much time and the kind of people that would be involved in implementing such a model. So for a commercial company, uh, that kind of thing would have to come through some sort of government, public-private partnership funded program. And there are some examples like that, like the DOE has this Infuse program where private companies, or private fusion companies can uh, submit for that kind of work uh, to be done uh, with their code, their platform, their reactor, their concept, but on a government funded platform. So that's a great place where public private partnerships can really excel, where you're leveraging uh, creative designs from the private sector and then existing government resources that may not have been doing anything. I mean, there may be downtime or just places where resources just aren't allocated uh, appropriately. So that's kind of 10 billion particles. Uh, if you want to do a model on your computer, uh, let's say you have a really nice laptop or a desktop and maybe you've got... Um, you know, four core processors or six core processors, or maybe you've got a, a couple thousand GPU processors, graphical processing units. So you got your CPUs, you got your GPUs. If you're doing something like that, um, you can run about 10 million, a million to 10 million particles on a desktop kind of computer. Uh, and, and you can do it on CPUs, like I mentioned, or on GPUs, uh, which are better, uh, graphical processing units, if you build the code based on a GPU-based system, you get more bang for your buck. Basically, you can do more on the machine going that way. Uh, but in some cases, you might want to get some custom code for that. Uh, in general, doing modeling, um, the particle and cell modeling, uh, the company to go to for that is a company called TechX. They're in Colorado. Um, they've been around more than 10 years. Uh, they have a commercial product called vSIM. It's anywhere from a couple hundred to maybe a couple thousand bucks. And vSIM is a plasma simulation tool that one can get, download, buy, uh, and then use. Um, if you're going to go private and you want to, say, farm out this, this thing, a good company is Voss Scientific. Uh, I think they're in New Mexico or Arizona. Um, they've been in the game uh, maybe 20 years in fusion, and they're kind of a team of people that are retired from the Air Force Research Laboratory uh, that, that do particle and plasma simulations, not just for fusion, but for other aerospace applications and other commercial applications. So they're a good team to uh, farm out to, and they've got they've got some in-house codes. Chicago Code is one of them. Chicago, it's an acronym. I don't know what it stands for, but that's that's one place you could go to. You could also contract with um, TechX directly in Colorado. They'll do some simulations for you. If you're going open source, a good option is Open Foam. Uh, that's a CFD slash plasma physics code. That you can you can do CFD in there, and I believe that there's a module that adds um, electromagnetic properties to the top of that, so that you can do full plasma uh, plasma physics simulations. 
Uh, and there are other codes as well, the um, ones I'm not mentioning. M- MCMP6 is a good one for Neutronix uh, and Fusion cross-section type stuff, uh, et cetera. So those are all the sort of commercial packages that are available. Now let's go back. Um, so let's talk about modeling frameworks. So what do I mean by a framework? A framework is math, basically the math equations and assumptions that you use to model this crazy thing called plasma. Um, it, that's the fundamental um, assumptions and equations that then go into the software that you would then use. So it's better to look at the broad, um, very broadly at the math and assumptions first before you get into the specific software that you're going to use or the specific computer tools that you're going to use. And this chapter goes over um, about six methods. Uh, six methods, well, actually really seven, the seven methods. It goes over seven different methods, excuse me. Um, I like to start with the most basic method, uh, which I recommend anyone who's new to a fusion approach and wants to understand how it works, what it does, uh, how plasma will behave inside it, uh, should take this Excel um, force method that I recommend. Uh, Let me describe that. I actually like it because I used to do it myself when I was encountering a new fusion reactor concept. What I would do is I would imagine the fusion reactor completely void, empty, basically. No plasma in it, just the fields in play, magnetic field, electric field, turned on, and basically at steady state. And then I would virtually put a particle, say an ion or an electron, basically a negative or a positive, in an XYZ point. Just put it in, drop it in at some point inside the reactor. Uh, What you can do next is you can calculate the forces on the particle uh, using Lorenz force or um, uh, Biot Savart law to calculate the magnetic field at that point and the electric field at that point. And then using the electric and the magnetic field, you calculate the Lorenz force, which is um, the charge times E plus B cross uh, V, or basically the, the direction of motion uh, the electric field and the magnetic field, and you, that force calculation, and you can look this up in the book, uh, will give you a force. And it'll say, this thing is going to go to the left by four newtons and up to the right by two newtons, say, for example. Then you take a, t- a step in time and you recalculate the position, recalculate the force, take another step in time, recalculate the position, take another step in time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can do this all in Excel. Uh, you can put it together in a couple of hours, maybe two, three hours, if you know what you're doing. Uh, and, and you can track a single particle as it moves around the reactor, as it goes through a magnetic field to, say, an electric field or an electric field to a magnetic field, vice versa, that sort of thing. And you can ask simple questions like, where is the particle going to turn around? For example, when is the particle, how far will the particle go before it gets to the top of the reactor and corkscrews down? Um, what's the velocity at the, at the thing? Uh, is, does it even make sense? Is this electric field strong enough to turn a particle around? Or is this magnetic field too weak to hold a particle in? These are all really kind of good feel questions that you can answer and internalize the structure and design of a reactor uh, when you first encounter it for the very first time. And I highly recommend it for anybody who's trying to understand uh, maybe a new tokamak, a new stellarator, a new um, ICF machine or uh, approach, a new fuser design, these sorts of questions. They're really helpful. It's a really good design. And if you're available, if you're interested, I have on uh, GitHub, uh, my account, I have an Excel spreadsheet where I set up one of these one of these models. And it's just iterative and time step. As you go down the Excel spreadsheet, you're moving forward in time. And I answer basic questions about forces on particles and, and that sort of thing. So modeling a single particle motion is a really great way for a pen and paper way, a simple way for a new person to understand how that fusion reactor works. And it's a really good way to do it. But modeling a single particle uh, obviously does not really um, encompass the physics of the reactor. If you want to really understand the physics of the reactor, you've got to do a complete model. 
Now, the next one uh, that I talk about is Magneto Hydrodynamic Modeling, MHD. MHD model modeling really can start or trace its lineage back to the 1950s uh, when someone named Lyman J. Spitzer wrote a little book called The Physics of Fully Ionized Gases, which essentially was him taking the ideal gas concept, the ideal gas equations, and then making them charged. So basically, ideal gas laws can go way back to the 1800s and was a real, real well, widely understood concept in uh, high school education at that time, middle school education, maybe. And it's understood by engineers. And most people know PV equals NRT. If you've been in high school, you probably learned that equation. Well, he was exactly he was Lyman J. Spitzer was taking that um, equation and other equations that are sort of built on those assumptions and the concept of that and then making it charged so that it's fully charged and then figuring out what would happen, adding some additional math to the framework to kind of understand what would go on if this was not just an ideal gas, but an ideal gas that had charges on it, positives, negatives, that sort of thing. Uh, And that was physics of fully ionized gases. And he uh, was essentially modeling plasma coming from the ideal gas equation where the plasmas are really, really low density. They have a lot of space between them. Particles really don't see one another except through force calculations, that sort of thing. Um, Now, from the other direction where plasma is really, really dense and the viscosity is really, really high, and it's sort of more like a fluid, um, one of the early modelers of that was a fella named, uh, well, Marshall Rosenbluth and uh, um, Grad. Um, Dr. Grad from the Grant Institute at the NYU. So let me talk about uh, Grad's work. Uh, Dr. Grad was a professor at the NYU Grant Institute in the 1950s and the 1960s. And he was a mathematician and a physicist. And his thing was applying uh, math equations to uh, plasma physics and doing bulk calculations. So what does plasma look like in a column or in a wave or in a a sphere or in some kind of shape? Um, And let's apply some math to kind of figure out what the bulk behavior is going to do in much the same way that uh, fluid mechanics uh, back in the early days in the 1920s and 30s. Um, CFD fluid mechanic people, it was all about like, what is the shape that water takes when it's put in a puddle or when it comes out of a faucet or when it's sprayed out of a hose? Let's apply bulk CFD Navier-Stokes equations to kind of calculate that. Uh, so Grad does the same thing in the 60s and seven, or 50s and 60s. But now it's fluid mechanics plus electromagnetics because this is a fluid that also conducts electricity. It has this electromagnetic property that you have to add in for and account for. So you have to add into the equations to basically do that. Marshall Rosenbluth, by the way, who becomes a famous plasma physicist, he's known as the Pope of Plasma Physics, and he was he was instrumental in, in fusion and plasma physics from uh, 1953 to 2003 when he passed away. Guy wrote like 100 papers or more. He worked at multiple, multiple institutions, General Atomics in Texas and Princeton and places in Europe, and he was on the Eater Commission. He's referred to as the Pope of, Pope of Plasma Physics. That guy also did the same thing, sort of applied these bulk equations and mathematics to plasma behavior. But Marshall Rosenblum's thing was he kind of wrote a whole bunch of papers that pointed out problems in various approaches. He'd say, well, I'm going to apply some theory and boom, I found this problem with your approach and here's a paper on it. And then he would go on and do that with another approach and another problem and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he was, he became known as uh, the Pope of Plasma Physics for a reputation of finding problems in all sorts of other approaches, be it FRCs, pinches, mirrors, uh, you name it. That's what he did. In any case, MHD modeling sort of started then. And it's the worst modeling that you can do. Uh, A lot of people in the science and physics and engineering world consider MHG to be like real cutting edge stuff because uh, solving for fluid uh, equations, the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid dynamics is hard enough. Uh, You know, I in college, like I had courses on that. It took me 45 minutes to do one problem where we'd model some fluid flow through um, through a pipe and we'd have to go through and do all this this work to because it's a partial differential equation. 
you got to integrate it. You got to dimensionalize it. You got to simplify it. You got to do all this work. Basically, that it's that plus electromagnetics, uh, which yields magnetohydrodynamics. But from a plasma physics point of view, it's hard to believe, but MHD is actually the worst modeling framework because it just captures bulk behavior. It just it treats the plasma almost like a giant empty balloon that just has nothing in it. And we can we can see the surface, but we don't really know what's going on internally. That sort of stuff is sort of beyond the reach of MHD. We need some more complete uh, a modeling framework. So MHD is the, the first model I talk about after I talk about that Excel thing. So if you're if you're keeping track, the Excel thing is is a two hour, three hour exercise that I recommend. That's model one. Model two is MHD. Model three is a complete Vaslov equation. So, so what's that? Uh, essentially, Vavlog, Vaslov um, is a total mathematical framework for a plasma. So no assumptions, no simplifications, no shortcuts. What is the entire math in, in its entirety that explains this plasma. So let me read from the book here. There are six equations in the Vaslov set. Um, the first two are fluid motion. The next four are Maxwell's equations. So we got two equations that cover fluid mechanics, computational fluid mechanics. So they're similar to fluid mechanics. Uh, and then we've got two, four equations that cover electro, electric fields, magnetic fields, and how the two interact. So first, first equation is the negative fluid motion. So it's an equation that governs the flow of electrons in an electromagnetic environment. So it's basically the fluid mechanics equation applied to the electric fluid, uh, which is just all the electrons in the plasma. Then we have the positive fluid mechanics equation. So that's the CFD equation for modeling fluid flow of positive things. So all the ions that are positively charged, they're a second fluid that are that's overlapping with the electrons. So in reality, they're mixed together. But you have one equation for the positives and one equation for the negatives. So that's the first two equations in the Vaslov set. The next four are Maxwell's equations that cover electromagnetics. So the first one is Faraday's law. Faraday's law uh, shows how a magnetic field impacts an electric field. Okay, so Faraday's law says, hey, if there's a change in the magnetic field, it will change the electric field. And that's an equation. The next one is Ampere's law that shows how an electric field will impact a magnetic field. If you're keeping track. So we got it going one way. Now we got to go with the other other direction. Then we have Gauss's law for electric fields and Gauss's law for magnetism. So one governs electric fields, one governs magnetisms. So this Vaslov set is six equations uh, that are pretty uh, powerful uh, pieces of mathematics. One covers a negative fluid, one covers positive fluid. One covers electromagnetic or um, electric fields impacting magnetic fields. One covers the opposite, one covers the electric field, one covers the magnetic field. These six equations together represent the Vaslov's equation. And it, it all that math uh, basically covers how a plasma would behave in a given situation. Now, long story short, most of the time that's impossible to solve. Like... If you're going first principles, if you want a complete explanation, those are your equations to use, but you really can't solve them. They're really uh, impossible mathematics to solve. I mean, we know what they are, but uh, in practice, it's really just impossible to use them in any real way. So we don't actually ever do that. Um, what we do instead is we do a lot of simplifications, shortcuts, and assumptions. And uh, one of the, the first ones that you do uh, in computer modeling is particle in cell. So particle in cells, uh, a modeling approach evolved from the Los Alamos National Laboratory in the 1960s from a guy named Frank Harlow, Dr. Frank Harlow. He ran, I think it was the T3 group 
at Los Alamos National Laboratories, don't quote me on that, um, which was essentially set up to study how to apply computers to modeling behaviors of plasma. And Los Alamos at the time had access to supercomputers that nobody else in the country had access to. So they were way, way, way ahead of anybody else in the world in terms of the tools that they had access to. So they could do this modeling, uh, you know, a decade or two or three decades before anybody else could do it. So they came up with this concept known as particle in cell. So you take a volume of space that has plasma in it and you crack it and break it into little cells little little cells maybe you'll have 10,000 cells in a given space or 100,000 cells in a given area and by the way you can do this as a 2D model where you just you take a slice and then that's the 2D model and then you just run it in a you um run it around the circle and to model the 3D object so if you're doing a tokamak, you can do a 2D model of just a slice of the, the, the reactor and then just assume that it's symmetric all the way around. So you're making an assumption about a geometric assumption. So you fracture it in a little cells and then you have the computer track particles. A particle is a, a bowling ball, billiard ball, dot um, object. Uh, in the computer that's sitting in a cell and it's got a positive charge and a negative charge and it might feel forces from the nearby particles, an electric force, a magnetic force, uh, an attractive force, it's a repulsive force. It's just sitting there and it's feeling all these forces. And it's also impacted by the larger bulk magnetic fields that you've imposed on your fusion reactor. So you've got that particle sitting there and the particle and cell code will calculate all the forces on that particle and then when you take a time step, everything will move. It'll suddenly move and you have to recalculate everything. And then you move and recalculate and move and recalculate. And as the particle moves from one cell to another cell, a, a different uh, processor might take over and watch a different chunk of the reactor. Particle and cell modeling. Frank Harlow pioneered it. They first did it on computational fluid dynamics and they published about uh, i don't know for maybe five to ten years they published this stuff and they were ignored actually the scientific community sort of wrote this off as a parlor trick a magic trick uh, like an animation it didn't really have value it wasn't useful uh it was just kind of this um gimmick kind of at the beginning they, they treated it uh kind of deferentially and then after you know they were ultimately vindicated 10 or 12 years later it, it became apparent that cfd modeling had real power and you could get information from cfd modeling that you couldn't get from anything else I say CFD because that's fluid mechanics. It also applies to particle and cell for plasma physics and fusion reactors. The same thing happens uh, there. So um, particle and cell. Now, that basic computer framework, we have the uh, cells and you have the particles. I should mention that the computer doesn't track every particle. In reality, it attracts super particles. So for every super particle, there might be a thousand real particles. Like a thousand real ions are represented by one ion in the computer simulation. So the computer simulation is already making a couple assumptions. If you're keeping track, one assumption about geometry, right? Like we're doing it in 2D, not 3D. And we're assuming symmetric stuff all the way around. That's an assumption. Uh, second assumption, we're, we're going to assume that this one super particle that the computer is tracking really represents a thousand actual real particles in real life. And it may not. It may not. So this is this is another place where modeling assumptions might screw you. Ultimately, you might get a, a result in a computer simulation that's not really what would happen in real life. So you got to remember that these are the assumptions you're making. And with every assumption comes a downside, some trade-off that you're making. You're, you're sacrificing some accuracy to make the machine work, or make the model work, make it practical, make it cost-effective, make it fit on your supercomputer or with your code, that sort of thing. So um, there are assumptions inside the particle in cell uh, framework. So one of the first ones is gyrokinetic modeling. 
So uh, for every super particle, you can describe it fully with six numbers, the X, the Y, the Z, and the uh, velocity X, Y, Z, um, six numbers. Now you can do it, you could do six other numbers. Uh, you could do momentum X, Y, Z, and location X, Y, Z. You could do forces X, Y, Z, and uh, uh, velocity X, Y, Z. Well, you need the location. Regardless, six numbers will describe where that particle is. So if you if you want to make your computer run faster and your model model work better or more practical, one way you can do that is throw out one of the six numbers by making another assumption. So a good one to make is called the gyro is the forms the basis of the gyrokinetic model, which is where instead of six numbers, you do five numbers. You throw out one number uh, because you're assuming that the particle will rotate around a, a magnetic field and you assume that the rotation radius of rotation is fixed and so therefore we can ignore it we can just completely ignore it and we'll do gyrokinetic modeling where we only have to track five numbers for every particle instead of six numbers and therefore our model suddenly works our model runs twice as fast because we're throwing out one of the numbers that sort of thing so that's gyrokinetic modeling Kinetic modeling is uh, you don't make any assumptions. You track all six particles in a particle in a cell. So if you're keeping track now, I've talked about four different models. Um, the Excel model, the Vaslov math thing, which nobody can use, but it's a complete description. Uh, the uh, gyrokinetic and kinetic modeling. Now there's the Kimitovich model, which is where you track every single, every single particle in a particle in cell situation. So we're at five now. Every single particle in a uh, particle simulation is called Kimitovich, named after a Russian fellow named Kimitovich, who proposed that, hey, we should track everything. Now, on paper, that, that looks great, but in practice, that almost never happens um, again. So particle and cell, you got three different options there. Most people will use kinetic or gyrokinetic uh, within the particle and cell framework. Uh, and then there's some futuristic stuff I'm talking about in the book called um, quantum field theory. There is a movement now, when I say now, I mean like 2018 onwards, to use quantum field theory to model particles. Um, and it, there's a PhD thesis from Princeton uh, that just was published in 2018 on this. Basically, uh, you treat the um the plasma like a web of forces like a spider web and each point uh, is an intersection of different force forces between all the other particles <clears throat> so if you do that then you inherit a completely new uh mathematical formulation like a totally new way to look at this this uh uh, cloud of charged materials mathematically uh, using Lagrange uh, equations. So Lagrange equations are great for networks. So you have um, a whole web of, of forces and then the Lagrange equation explains the differential on that network of forces. How if you tug one line in that web, you get a ripple effect of other forces being pulled or pushed in other directions elsewhere in the network. So you're applying this Lagrangian mathematics, which is the, which is looking at the cloud of plasma like a force network um, where all the particles have some force interacting with some other particle in the web. And so you can apply this to Lagrangian mathematics, which gives you a, an entirely new way to look at the same problem mathematically, whole new way to look at the same problem. And it tells you different things and it can be applied in weird situations where um, like the Vaslov equations fall apart, basically. So quantum field theory is an interesting uh, framework for looking at plasma. I don't think it's as widely applied. Uh, certainly a lot of the codes don't include it, right? Because like you come up with a math framework, you come up with some assumptions to make it work. And then the next thing you do is you sit down and you write software and you write practical commercial 
special software that that you then hand to somebody and say, hey, here, uh, you know, create your fusion reactor geometry, enter your initial conditions, press go, and we'll run your plasma and tell you where you are in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. We'll tell you how hot it gets, how cold it gets, what's your fusion rate, um, what, uh, what else you can do to make the thing work better how you can improve the overall quality of the machine by improving the magnetic fields, decreasing this, increasing that, these sorts of questions. So uh, quantum field theory hasn't really been applied uh, as much, but it's an interesting little wrinkle in the modeling approach. So if you're keeping track, I talked about a whole series of models here. We talked about uh, Excel spreadsheets, we talked about um, uh, Vaslov equations, which are great, but they don't actually work. We talked about particle and cell modeling, and then we talked about three different options there, kinetic, gyrokinetic, and Kimitovich. And then we talked about this new age quantum field theory stuff, which is coming out uh, from Princeton. So these are all modeling frameworks. Again, a framework is a set of math and a set of assumptions. Those things are baked into the software that you would then use to apply to stuff. We talked about what a, a model would look like if you did it in practice. You know, 10 billion particles, you're going to run that on a supercomputer uh, at a government laboratory. Uh, 10 million particles you can do on your home computer. And I was involved in a, a for example, I was involved in a fusion startup uh, called uh, Convergence Scientific, which was at the uh, out in Washington State. And uh, the, the technical fellow there wrote his own particle and cell uh, software from scratch. Uh, and he based it around uh, the GPU processor. But he, he took like, you know, two to three years to write this thing from scratch uh, to do a particle and cell modeling. And he can model a million particles, you know, 10 million particles, something like that. You know, if I'm a commercial team, I would definitely want to outsource all this um, from, from, a, from the high level perspective. You, you hire the modeler to answer answer questions. You want to understand things. You want to ask questions like, should this reactor be bigger, smaller? How much bigger? How much smaller? Uh, are we on the right track or are we way off? Do we need do we need to double something or shrink something? And you can farm all that out. Just pay someone to do this work for you. And uh, there's a couple good uh, teams out there. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to somebody else that I recommend uh, you check out. His name is Lobos. Uh, he's a per, uh, assist, associate professor and has his own private modeling company out in Los Angeles. He's written a book. You can Google it. Uh, I uh, Lobos Beretta is his full name, Lobos Beretta. Look up his modeling book. It goes through every single thing you can think of with models and the software and the practical implementation of all this stuff. So he's, he's a really good resource uh, if you're out there looking for help. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions. Again, we're going to provide uh, references to all this stuff uh, in the YouTube video so you can, you can get the references. And uh, take care. Bye. Hello, folks. Sorry about that. Uh, there was more content in the modeling chapter that I just didn't get to. I wanted to talk about the two fluid model. Uh, it was just a very important model. It was probably the, uh, cutting edge uh, in roughly the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, as I said earlier, plasma is a fluid that conducts electricity and it's, it has two principal components, positives and negatives. So the two fluid model treats the plasma like two overlapping fluids, one negative, one positive. It makes the assumption that the ions and electrons never physically touch, uh, which is a fine assumption to make, and their only interaction is through their electrostatic uh, force uh, interactions between the two. So it's two overlapping fluids uh, that interact uh, using electrostatics, so they can literally pass over each other. That's the two fluid uh, assumption. So from that assumptions, if you apply those to the Vaslov equations, you get a whole set of equations that sort of fall out of that. And this was done in the 1970s and 1980s by the Naval Research Laboratory. And they famously put all these equations together in a little booklet called the NRL Plasma Formulary, which you can get a copy of for free. Uh, you used to be able to go on their website and, um, you know, set up your 
contact information and they would literally mail you uh, a little pocket sized booklet that had all these two fluid equations in it. Um, person who was in charge of that is Dr. Joe Huba, who uh, is now uh, retired from NRL, but he's still around and he's still putting out edition after edition of this NRL plasma formulary, which is what was in the 80s and 90s, basically a Bible for fusion because it had these practical equations uh, that could estimate different rates of things, but it was all based on this two fluid um, assumption model, this this framework for modeling plasma with two fluids. Uh, now, that, those equations were used by Todd Harrison Ryder at MIT in 1994. Uh, to model uh, plasma in a what I call a blob. A blob of plasma uh, is a uh, homogeneous, unstructured, isentropic uh, bit of plasma that's thermalized and uh, giving off X-ray radiations. Todd Harrison Ryder modeled that at, and then made some conclusions. Uh, and then that sort of had sweeping implications for a whole variety of fusion concepts that all had blob-like plasma in their centers. Uh, and Todd Harris and Todd Ryder's uh, work was a thesis from MIT and uh, multiple papers that came out. He basically argued that a lot of uh, fusion approaches will fundamentally fail because they're they have blob plasma and then they're subject to these fundamental limitations, uh, basically that they uh, emit so much energy through radiation losses, X-ray losses, Brunstrel losses, uh, synchrotron, cyclotron losses, that they can't make net power. Um, so this is actually, I talk about this a lot more in another lecture, but I, but I just wanted to talk about that. Two fluid was sort of the bee's knees in the 90s, uh, and it's a great little uh, framework. Of course, there are better frameworks. Particle and cell is much better, uh, and uh, Kimitovich uh, model is the best, gyrokinetics, kinetics. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy the lecture series. Uh, take care. Bye.